That's wonderful to have you for this conversation with our special guest, Leslie Blodgett. Um, Leslie, as we get started, these folks on the line have seen your bio, but would you be willing to share a little bit more about your career and life in your own words? Yeah, I, I'm Leslie Blodgett. I am a beauty industry person since I'm very young. Um, I am the creator of Bare Minerals, which is a beauty brand, global beauty brand. I'm a mother of a son. I'm a grandmother of a grandson. And I've been married almost 34 years. That's, hi, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie's waving to um, our mutual wonderful friend, Jen Goldfarb, who worked with Leslie at Bare Minerals. So wonderful to have you, Jen, and welcome. Um, Leslie, I'm so excited to have this conversation. You just came out with a new book called Pretty Good Advice. I almost never read advice books because a lot of them are written by people who just haven't been in the trenches. They haven't had the door slammed in their face. They haven't been told no. They haven't really had to just muck around until they figure it out. And you have, and you've had such a phenomenal personal and professional story, which you share across almost a hundred many pieces of advice in this book, um, Pretty Good Advice. And I wanna dive in and actually use your book as the backbone and framework for this conversation today. And um, there's one anecdote that you tell early in the book, and it's about when you were a very early in your career and you were working as a beauty advisor at Macy's and you found yourself feeling totally turned off by um, these saleswomen who were really aggressively pitching eye cream. And you said, I don't want to be good at selling. It's a privilege to serve people. And to do that well, I need to believe in what I'm doing. And I want to just position this comment in um, the context that Leslie gave a very modest um, opener. She sold her company, Bare Minerals, in 2010 for $1.8 billion. So she has done a phenomenal job of building a world-changing company. Um, and so Leslie, I wanted to get back to this piece of advice. Can you say a little bit more about that philosophy? I need to believe in what I'm doing. Okay, yes. Well, first I did wanna say thank you for inviting me and thank you all for showing up today. Um, yeah, so first of all, I hate advice books too. And I can't even believe that I have a book called Pretty Good Advice, but I think it's a funny title because it's pretty good. It's not like amazing. So if you like three of them, then you get what you get. So I think um, for me, yeah, that was one of my early experiences with this idea of people lying to sell something. And then I, I started thinking about this that there are people who make a living and there are people who have to live with themselves while they're making a living. And I would rather be doing that. I'd rather feel good about what I'm doing than go home and like, they were proud of lying. And there's a lot of that still goes on regularly. So my, my feeling is that I learned this early on that to live more a meaningful life. And I ended up working, many hours a week my whole life. So I always, when I was in college the first time, uh, the second time I had uh, six jobs while I was going to school at FIT. So I wor worked really hard. Uh, and each time I worked in these companies, I was just grateful to be there and just learn about the product that I was um, you know, offering to people. And it was a pay, I needed the money to survive because no one was helping me out. So it was just really a way of living with myself and feeling good about it. And then at the same time, feeling that if I died today, I would have done the right thing. So it was something that has been with me my whole life. I'm a competitive person. I like to win. I like to build the company, but I just have to do it in a way that feels right to me. So at Macy's behind the counter, um, I didn't always have the highest sales, but the people that I, uh, were helping out at the end of the day. This is New York City in Macy's. People would come after work and they just wanted to hang out, get their makeup done. Meanwhile, my coworkers are make, making $5 on an anti-aging cream if they could sell it. So they would say they were 10 years older, look at my skin so that they can make five extra bucks. And they were probably racking in the bucks themselves. But um, those people just never felt really good. I, I just didn't, mine would come back. They, would, they wouldn't maybe, 
buy a ton of stuff each time. But that's my point. Like it, I, I took it personally what I was doing. Did I answer your question, Bethany? Yes, you did. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. All right. And um, and the last thing you said was I took it personally, and you also ran your business in an exceedingly personal way. And and yeah. one way that that sort of evolved for you and one way that, that you represented that was by being super customer focused um, and developing real relationships with your customers at Bare Mineral. You're, you're well known for this philosophy mm -hmm. um, and you and your team really strove for that connection. You said at one point, people want to belong to something real. You can't ideate a friendship and it turns out genuine friendships can be good business too. Um, Will you talk about that insight a little bit more, the insight of actually having real authentic relationships with your customers and how that helped you build Bare Minerals? Yeah, so I, I wanna start by saying that most of the stuff that I did had nothing to do with like a plan at, in the beginning. There was no strategy around it. I didn't even really know what I was doing, but I did know that the defining uh, beginning origin moment was when I went on QVC for the first time. The business wasn't really booming at all. We weren't doing that well. We were, for those of you who don't know, Bare Minerals is a loose powder foundation, which you buff on with a brush. Liquid foundation is what people were buying. No one ever heard of a powder. So it was a completely innovative form. So no one was, no one was buying it. So when I had this idea to go ask QVC if I can go on, sell it on the home shopping channel. The only reason that came to me was because I was up in the middle of the night worried about sales. And that's what I ended up watching on television. So that's the only reason that idea came to me. So when I went on TV myself, because I couldn't afford a celebrity to do it for me, here I am, this regular person who was an expert in beauty, by the way, but most beauty brands had celebrities or models selling their product. Nobody had like a regular person. So here, and this was 1997. So I go on air and I'm just being the expert that I am that's been in the industry a while and we sold out, which was amazing. But it wasn't until I got back to the office when I got a phone call from one of our uh, viewers to ask me what nail polish I was wearing on air. So I thought, oh my God, somebody actually was paying attention. So she told me that there was a whole online community developing around questions around my brand. So that night I went on to the threads and the chat rooms and I spent four hours a night for the first 10 months every night, even though I had a kid, a baby at home. And then I stayed online for 10 years every day, just not four hours a day. And I got to know these people before the business was even taking off, but it was, it was those relationships that became real overnight. So I had names to the people that were buying my stuff. And once you know them, and once they're counting on you personally, then you really, you really want to make it happen for them. You really want to include them. And, and you, you, now they're not a number. I came from consumer uh, package good companies where we just looked at spreadsheets. We never talked to anybody. So I felt like this ownership then. So as we were growing, it was important, not just for me, I wasn't hiding behind spreadsheets. With everyone in the company had to then know what we were doing and who these people were. So it, I couldn't take that heavy burden myself. And it was a burden only because quality control, um, answering their questions, making sure that um, they're credit card went through and they weren't getting a hassle that way. There, were, there was a lot, every department needed to realize that these people that were paying their bills, that were you know, paying their salary were really, really important to us. So I developed those relationships and I and then needed to make sure that the people working for the company also felt that same way because it's, uh, these are human beings that are parting with their hard earned money and they should feel really um, indebted to these people for that. So I've always felt, uh, because I had that experience early on, if I didn't have that experience, if I had money to buy a print ad or to do a TV campaign, if I had, if we had raised all this money and I went the traditional route, I would never have known the power and the beauty of, of connecting with people. But we became a community brand in the nineties 
before social media because that's actually how a real, you know, the magic happens with any brand is that they know that you're listening to them. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to just underscore a couple things that you just said. This was 1997. There was no Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, right? Like Leslie was spending a ton of time on these individual chat rooms to really connect deeply with her customers. And the Bare Minerals customers were uniquely involved in the business. They engaged in product development, Leslie, with you and your team, and you all named products in their honor. And you said, when you belong to something, you can have influence. Real community isn't just about following, it's about taking ownership. And you just used the word ownership as you were reflecting on this period in, in um, the company's life cycle. Um, how else did that come into view for you fully? Like, when did you see your customers really taking ownership over the Bare Minerals um, brand and, and product line? Yeah, yeah, I think from the very early days, because it, I was new at it and I didn't have a lot of mentors and there weren't a lot of groups of CEOs and I really didn't know a lot about it. I relied on them, the women who used the product, to tell me what they thought. And when we ended up started launching new products, they were my go-to. So we would create with the product development team and the marketing team, we had these women who I engaged with very early on and we would use them to test our products. We would send out um, copy in advance. We would pipe them into meetings so that they could be asked questions. One of my best um, advisors, and this is in the book too, is a mother of three from Michigan who um, was a great knitter and she was a stay-at-home mom. And I would call her, she just had great advice for me. So, and she knew the product and the purpose of the company so well. And there was that idea of being a little bit of an outsider. So I would take advice and ideas from people who used the product and then they would weigh in. So when it became clear that they actually know a lot, they were learning beauty at the same time that some of the, our employees too, that it just made sense for us to go to them and say, all right, what, uh, what kind of eyeshadow color are you looking for? They would blend them in their homes. We would, once you name them after a customer, all of a sudden they are huge, hugely um, powerful advocates for your brand. And, you know, they didn't have social media, but if they told 10 people, I mean, our brand was 100% word of mouth. We didn't do advertising until we did our infomercials, but they would tell their friends, their friends would tell friends. Since the beginning of trade, it's, it's always been word of mouth and that still is the most powerful tool. So um, we would send, even there was one point on QVC, uh, we sold a product on QVC that wasn't even quite, the packaging wasn't ready. It was just a, a jar with a, a label on it that said neck cream, but we wanted to get it out there. The packaging wasn't ready, but they forgave us for that. And they also felt like they were on the inside of something very special. So everyone becomes an insider when you are in constant contact with them. So they felt respected. So basically there was respect. We were all peers. They were, they were, I was a mom, they're moms. We work, we're working moms. We'd give each other advice. And when we were on the threads talking to each other, we would talk about makeup like 25% of the time. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time we were talking about life. And that's why we, we did grow up together and we'd bring new people in. So it's, um, you know, you you find your mentors and your advisors in very strange places. But if, you know, I, my feeling is if you, if your mentor is mentoring a hundred other people, then maybe they're just good at mentoring, but maybe they don't, they're not cutting through um, the, the life part of it. So I, I like to just be a little bit diverse about where I get some of my input from. Mm -hmm. And you actually... Um, you said in your book, don't forget your phone is a phone. Talking yeah. to customers is never a distraction, make time. And we've heard this from, um, from CEOs and founders in the past that sometimes the most obvious thing that needs to be done in terms of running and building a business is non-obvious when you're under the crush of getting stuff done every day. Um, but even in that rush of activity and, and chaos and craziness, 
every single day you made time to actually get on the phone and talk with customers. Yeah, by the time we were a large company, I was still um, talking to 25 people a week and my assistant would get uh, phone numbers from our database and I would call them randomly or our customer service department was on a couple floors below us and I would um, grab the phone and just ask them. There's something about um, making it easy for people to just tell you what's on their mind. And it's, it's different when they're writing, filling out a survey. It's just you hear tonality in their voice. You ask them to be super honest. Tell me the worst thing that's happened. Tell me the best and you bring that data. I mean, it's all data. The, the spreadsheets, the, um, all the metrics are, are part of decision-making, including what's really in their voice. And I started getting good at that. I also would travel every weekend to boutiques and stores and look them in the face one-on-one -on -one each time. If there were 500 people in line to talk, I was able to look right at them and they would tell, tell me the truth. And you get used to, you learn how to get people to tell you the truth because you don't always want to hear the good stuff. So. I'm a huge believer in handwritten notes. And by the way, I have your note here that you sent me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a huge believer in um, even putting those notes that you get from your customers on a wall. I had that at work too, the customer wall. So we, everyone that walked by could see this is like real feedback from people. And also um, just touching base. And I've, I've done one social media hit and there was Facebook and Twitter. And there were the bullies that would come out, you know them, who would everything, you couldn't do anything right. I would reach out to those people hmm. and get their number and ask them, can, here, can you please email me your phone number? I want to talk to you. And then all of a sudden you, you know, you, I love to call out the bullies and be kind about it. I mean, I, I, obviously they're having other issues in their lives and it's not me, but um, if you, the more I talk to those people, the more I understand the pressures that are they're living in their lives. And maybe uh, they don't need to take it out on brands and, and other people on social media. So I'm not afraid to um, talk to people. And I always recommend that to um, young entrepreneurs and founders to mm -hmm. just keep that up as a habit. Um, Leslie, we're starting to get some questions from our audience, which I'll interweave as we go here. And I want to remind everyone, one thing that I appreciate and admire so much about Leslie's story is that she didn't start at a starting line that said a billion dollars. Her first job was at a McDonald's. Um, she worked the beauty counter at Macy's. Um, she was rejected from the Fashion Institute the first time that she applied. Um, this is someone who has worked for every single advance and success. And I think that that's just so awesome and inspiring. And Gabriella Durango has a question here, which might um, harken back to some of those earlier times in your career when Bare Minerals wasn't an obvious success yet. It wasn't even clear that it was going to be a success. And you talk about some of that fear in your book. And she says, have you ever doubted yourself in your career? And if so, how did you overcome? I always doubted myself. In fact, um, there's a section in the book that's like two lines and it's, uh, it says your heroes are insecure. So, and that is true. And I'm insecure or maybe a better way to say it is I have insecurities. Maybe I'm not insecure, but there's always uh, there's always something in my mind telling me, can I, hey, I just wrote a book. That's a scary thing to do. So what I, you know, who knows if it's going to work or not. I have just, um, I like being the underdog. I think that's a really powerful way to look at life is that, and, and by keeping your expectations low is the other thing. I like a low bar where people, people like, that's a, I like uh, such a high bar. No, my bars are really low because I like to see the bars. I like to jump over them and just have a million bars that I jump over. So I, I have just a whole different way of looking at life. I am also an anxious person. I live with anxiety. I'm telling you the truth here. People with anxiety who have insecurities, um, who have low bars can do really well. You don't have to be like, I had a mother who was always telling me what was wrong with me. So I didn't have that like, you can do it at it. No, I, so you can, you can over, you can overcome that. And one of the, uh, 
one of the things that I wanted to say about that is, and we, the more challenges you have, it's, we all have, we wake up every morning and we decide, what are we going to do? Who are we going to be? What decisions are we going to make? We all have sadness and um, challenges and heartbreak and disappointments. We all do. But every day you have a choice. What, what is that day going to look like? What is your future going to look like? So I have my horrible divorce of my parents when I was a kid that I could still be thinking about. It could hold me back. There were so many of those, but I just try not to remember those. I try and think about, here's a new day. What am I going to do today? And the, the other way is that when, I, when I'm old, I want to be able to look back. I always think about when I'm old. <laughs> I want to be able to look back and say, you know what, I just stayed true to owning up to all of the shit that I have around that voices and all that stuff. Tell them to sit down. I'm doing my thing right now. I could do this. Why not? Why can't I do this? There are many, plenty of other people that are doing it. Why can't I? So, you know, I, I just think it's, it's really a mindset. It's just how you feel you need to get through each day. And it's your power, you know, it's your personal power that you need to decide how you want to use. So it's, uh, yeah, I, li I live with those same um, insecurities, but I'll tell you my trick too, is that I like biographies. So I read biographies, not autobiographies, but biographies, because then you see everything about the person that you admire and Im imperfection is beautiful. So, um, and I know they, my favorite biography is Washington by Ron Chernow. George Washington, and he, uh, the guy was not perfect, well, obviously, but I think um, I like to read about people and all the stuff that they had to overcome. It makes me feel better about my life. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's the same, and that's why I wanted to shine a light on your path that you've walked. Yeah, um, one of the things that you say in the book that, that you just touched on here, which I found super uplifting, is personal power is a choice at any age. You're never too young and never too old to rise up to the opportunity of the moment. And that's what you're talking about, that this is every day, it's, it's up to us to determine how that day is going to go. It's not like some unseen force can lead us down a direction without you know, our will um, imposed on it. Yeah. I, I think that we, um, ex exactly, we have to, you know, just make this decision. Every, I've made, um, I've made some great decisions. One of them was when I double booked um, a date, I had two guys come to the door and this was in the eighties. And one of them had a bouquet of flowers and a bottle of wine and the other one had nothing. And I chose the guy, I forgot, I booked them both at the same time, whatever, very, very popular in the 80s. Uh, I picked the guy with the flowers and uh, we got married like eight months later and he's my husband. So, um, you know, you just, you know, you have to just own up to, to your, uh, the decisions that you make, but each one could be really important. <laughs> So I, I think that we are all really powerful people. We're all so uh, unique. But on the, on the other side, one, another place that I get my power is feeling ordinary and mm -hmm. feeling small. So I don't, I don't feel like I'm better than anybody else. I just feel that I'm different than everybody else. So I like being, uh, I like having things in common. And I think that was another part of building the business that was really powerful for me too, is that my me too, and I used to say me too all the time, I would meet people and I would want to find out what we had in common. Oh, I have a son, me too. Oh, I've been married 10 years, me too. I was, when I, the more I said me too, the more I knew that I'm the same as these people, they're the same as me and I could serve them. So I was always looking for, it's, you know, me too has taken on a whole different thing, but I, um, I'm always looking for opportunities to say me too. And then I know I could be of service. Mm -hmm. And part of what you're talking about right now is cultivating an emotional connection to other people. And you are known for this clearly with your customers, um, but even just bringing emotion to work. And Leslie, the first time I heard you speak, I was actually at Stanford and it was 
Um, it was about 15 years ago, and it was such an inspiring moment for me because up until that point, every CEO and founder that I had seen looked nothing like me and, and had nothing like the path that I had walked. And when I saw you get up there and talk about your background and your journey, it really, what resonated was that, gosh, you know, there are lots of different ways to show up in this world and lots of different ways to be successful. And one of your keys to success is bringing that emotion to work. And in fact, in the book, you wrote about the necklace that you're wearing right now. And so this is a necklace that spells love in big enough letters that people can see it from across the room. Um, and part of why you did that so explicitly was to put it out there. And can you talk a little bit more about why you brought those emotions to work and why that was important to you? Yes, uh, and I, I believe that um, passion is an emotion and intense passion is, is another emotion. Um, and the only, I truly believe that the only way to build a company is if love exists. You want to love what you do you want to love the people you work with. You want to love the people you're serving. And it can't be like a lot. Like a lot is different than love. So I believe that when you are talking about love out loud, that we love what we're doing, we love our product, that everyone has to. Everyone has to believe in that. You have to believe in love to, to make it successful. And loyalty does exist. And loyalty is real. And I know that nowadays people talk about everything so fragmented and people, they're not really, no. We fall in love with how we're treated and you need to build that into your organization and you need to build that into the product, everything you do. So there's not cutting corners. And that's why, you know, going back from my Macy's days, there isn't a lot of um, caring when you're just selling it for the money. So if you just have to change um, how, how you look at business, business is about p ls for sure, but how do you get there where you feel that everyone is, is in it together? So I um, was very clear that we love the people we serve and we will love our jobs even more. So I wear this necklace and whenever, so I wear this, I would wear this to conferences when I was speaking gigs, um, going around, um, even to trends like lacrosse games. I, everyone just smiles. I mean, this is like, you, you can't help it. I also have one that says cool, C-O-O-L, I'm super cool. And in case people didn't know, I wanted to tell them that too. So I had several different necklaces, but this is the best one because it's a relief. When people see, they're like, oh my gosh, she, she gets it. Because we all know it. So I'm just saying love is okay at work. It should be at work. And when you do have that emotion at work, it, it starts happening. Mm -hmm. um, Leslie, we have a question from our Breakline alum, Haley Wilson. And she's talking about um, sort of the flip side of being emotionally available is that you're also making yourself available to be hurt sometimes. And um, you actually shared a story in the book about someone who, um, who really hurt you. And you had to take a minute, you had to take a breath before you reacted to that person and, and sort of avoid the temptation to lash back. Um, and Haley's talking about, you know, how did you deal with the fear or reality of negative reviews or public relations failures? but also just negativity in general. And I, that story I thought was so powerful, um, particularly for working moms, but certainly for, for anyone. I wonder if you'll share it in the context yeah. of Haley's question. Oh my gosh. So, all right, so I'm an emotional person and sometimes there were many, many years where I would just react and in a bad way. And I had to put, give myself that 24 hour rule, even the five minute rule, because I would fly off the handle and it was not good. So this is, um, so I, I have reflection. This book is a lot about reflection, but there was this one time where I got a letter from a childhood friend who was my next door neighbor and we were really close. She sent me a letter not that long ago that told me that um, a working mother is unacceptable that a mother needs to be home to raise her children 
and your husband who stayed home and forgot about a career, he put 100% of his life into raising our son. Men cannot do what women can do. It was one of those letters. And I, just you bringing this up, Bethany, I was starting to, my chest was getting tight again. It still does it. And I can't even read that chapter without getting upset. My original reaction, so I, I read it to a few people at work. My original reaction was, all right, we're going to take this letter. We're going to put it on Facebook. This was a real hammer letter. We're going to put it on Facebook. We're going to shame this person. No way. Working women. We, we have a right to do this. And then that was my first reaction. And then I just took a breath. And I, and I thought, you know what? Um, I need to be better than that. I need to, I have a son who is the, is the reason this letter was written because I'm the mother who's the son. So I decided to not be a jerk. So that's the title of this chapter. It was, um, it's called Don't Be a Jerk. I should not be acting this way. I should be rising above this. It's not easy to do at all. But I took it one step further it's one thing to say, okay, don't react, but I decided to write her a note back, really nice note, thanking her for her, her thoughts. And I sent her a gift of product. And so not only did I just release that from myself, but I took it one step further and I showed my son that you don't have to get angry about this. You can uh, be a better person because of it. So I do feel like that was one of those instances where she, that could have affected me for years. I could have been angry back and that I would have just fed into this hatred and that was not how I wanted to live my life. So it was a good moment for me that usually once you, uh, once you get that personal, uh, your instant reaction would be, it, it could hurt you and hurt the family. So um, it was hard. The other thing I do, so number one is I try not to be a jerk. I have to breathe. The other one is to block it out. And that's also in the book. Mm -hmm. There are many things that happen in your life that are horrifying and you will continue to repeat it in your head or you can say, I'm done with that one. There's no reason to keep rehashing it. So blocking it out works. I mean, your therapist might say it's a bad idea, but I don't have a degree in medicine or anything. like. So I think that blocking things out that are unhealthy for you is not a bad idea. So, um, I'm don't be a jerk and block it out Two very different, but they both work for me. And it's also part of this philosophy that you've, um, you've enumerated to us, which is about, you can choose, you can choose right. how you respond to this. You can choose whether or not to let this stick to you or to let it go. Um, so I, I love that consistency. Um, and, um, I think at the same time that you're talking about being deliberate and being really thoughtful with these decisions, you're also a fan of being spontaneous. And um, you talked about sort of giving talks to big audiences and, and being a sought after expert. And your approach in this era where the, it almost feels like an antiseptic era where, that we're living in where everything that's published by a recognizable leader is highly polished and curated and um, you know perfect. You go after spontaneity and riffing and um, and sort of an energy around that. Um, and you've said always plan to be spontaneous. A little riffing goes a long way. What's behind that for you? Yeah. So uh, number one. And this is very a very personal thing, but I think it could be good advice too. I um, I don't I have a terrible fear of public speaking even to this day. So one thing that has always worked for me because you have to I'm an introvert and I don't like public speaking, so I have to act like I'm an extrovert in many cases in my life. And one way for me to get comfortable with that is to always have like one minute before a big presentation to just spontaneously riff about what's coming to mind. And just, it helps the audience see that I'm like a real person. It shows that I'm in the moment because I am in the moment. Um, and I, I just want to be present with them at, at that time. So I always leave 20 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute where I'm just casually. Now, my rule is, and it would never happen, but it, you can't be mean at all as a in this spontaneous period. So you have to be kind and you can be, it could be observational. 
Also, I'm uh, part of Jennifer Ocker's um, humor series business class at Stanford, which is part of the um, Graduate School of Business. And that's one of the things that I would do um, is to maybe say something funny or uh, just to release some tension. So there's the riffing is, um, it just helps me ease into a situation because I'm nervous. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you're, if you're not comfortable. The other, the other thing is, I don't remember sound bites. I just can't. There, there are people who are really good at that stuff. I'm just not good at it. I would probably mangle it to the point where uh, I'm just better um, just naturally being myself than trying to be something I'm not. That's the other thing. Practice being yourself is better than trying to be something you're not. People will automatically be more attracted to that uh, sentiment, I believe. I love that. And that, that was part of what really inspired me about you when I first saw you 15 years ago was that authenticity. You lead with authenticity um, in a way that's unique in this environment. And Shannon Lavin, who's here with her mom, welcome Mrs. Lavin, we love having you. Um, she has a question along these lines. She says, you are the queen of defying convention in an inspiring way. Has it always been easy to break the rules and stay true to yourself? So thank you. So I, I think that from a very young age, I, I also believe our childhoods are extremely important. Every, so much of my childhood um, was part of my management style of growing up. Um, my mother would not let me look like the other kids with my clothes. I, I, couldn't buy the, the latest fashion. My mother sewed all my clothes. So uh, the whole idea of being a copycat was never allowed. So when you, when you get that at a very young age, you, uh, you learn to try and do things your own way. So it was a mentality that was kind of fed into my um, upbringing. So I always looked at um, business that way too. If it's been done, it's harder to separate yourself as a company or as a brand or as a service if you're just trying to follow somebody else's lead. So I always, uh, that's how everything became unconventional. And you know, it's been fun with the book because this is my first new product in a while and it's a completely new category. And I don't know about how books are sold or how, how it's done, but it's given me an opportunity to not do what other books are doing. Now, I didn't have um, a choice with, with the shelter in place and the quarantine. I had a book tour planned. So it's great. I had to do things unconventionally anyway. But I'd like to, um, you know, and it's easier to fail when you do it unconventionally because that's your excuse, you know? I, oh, I didn't do it the way everybody else does. <laughs> but it gives you permission to, to try different things. And I think that people on teams like to get a, behind stuff that's different. And it, it helps um, build on the creativity of those ideas. So I, I also get bored easily. And it's just a way to build on people's creative side. Mm -hmm. And I actually wanna go one step deeper into part of your hiring philosophy and thought process. And this really resonates with me because as you know, Breakline's mission is to work with people from unconventional backgrounds as they transition into careers in tech. And so I love this quote from you, which is when I'm building a team, I don't rely on professionals who have worked in the same industry their entire careers. I like blending a little flesh, fresh blood into the mix, type O for original thinkers. And I'll say that um, Jen Goldfarb, who's here with us today, is a great example of that. She didn't have a beauty background when she joined Bare Minerals and then learned so much through that part of her career and then founded her own beauty company, Ipsy. So it's a really wonderful example of choosing someone from a different space and, um, and helping them grow into, um, into to, to their potential. And so, Leslie, can you talk to us about why this philosophy is important to you? Yeah, well, you know, we are a California company in the Bay Area, and most of the beauty brands were in New York. And in New York, a lot of the executives and the managers would move from company to company. So they were all, they all had five companies under their belt. They would just move from one to the other. And out here, um, you didn't have as many beauty people. You were bringing in other people. And what was happening was they were the best devil's advocates 
they were the ones poking the holes in everything. They didn't live the history of the category. They, everything was new to them and they were just asking all the right questions. So when you blend those different types of people on the team, they keep you on your toes because they're that engaged with, if it was, if it was done before, they would say, that's okay, let's do it again a new way. Instead of someone saying, oh no, we tried that five years ago, but you know what? It's a new time, there's a new audience, there's new people. So it, I just, I always felt that when you, you allow these people to have those debates, and I'm really big on, on debating and that fun fighting kind of stuff, you, uh, great stuff can come out of that. And I also think that um, the, uh, you, don't, you don't make as many of the mistakes that the industry would make over and over again when you have all the different angles covered. So uh, yeah, I think the original thing, also curiosity. I think if you are in the industry for a really long time, you're good if you were super curious anyway and you have a life outside of work. That's a really important too, is the ones that work 24 hours a day in their job, in their space, and they're not doing other things, they also can miss out. Mm -hmm. um, Eric Gonzalez has a question for you. He says, hi, Leslie. Would you say you seek mentors or have discovered mentors along your journey? And with that, what traits have been present in the mentors in your life? And Leslie, I wonder if as part of your response to this question, if you want to share a little bit about your bridge group. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I can't say I've had many mentors in my life. I didn't, there weren't like good networks for that back then. Um, so I, I can't say what, what I do have though are friendship mentors, which is what Bethany was just talking about. I didn't even have a lot of friends when I was uh, building the company because I had my son and my husband and I worked and I traveled a lot. So I kept pretty close that way. But once um, I turned 50, I realized that you can have friends over 50 at, over a certain age. And I just got hooked up with a, one woman who's in the book, Jennifer Ocker, who's also the one from Stanford. She introduced me to a bunch of other women and we decided to call ourselves the bridge group, even though we don't play bridge, but we drive over bridges in the Bay Area to get to each other. So it's a different kind of bridge group. There are 10 of us and we're all working women. Most of us are the breadwinners in the family. Um, and we have operationalized it. So basically what that means is we have certain, wasn't, remember the Flintstones? They had like that Boomba Club, whatever that was. Anyway, it was kind of like where we have certain amount of three meetings a year where we have to show up in person. We have our, our goals and intentions for the year we do in January. So we, um, we are there for each other, completely confidential, 100% judgment free. And there's a, a long list of things that we are there for each other. And that has kind of replaced the idea of a mentor for me in my life. So I think um, taking friendship one step further. The thing about uh, friends is that you really, they really need to be unconditional and supportive for whatever you need. And they, there can't be the envy or um, ego or jealousy involved, or it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work so well. So we've, we have to be very clear in this group that that's how we proceed and, and help and support each other. Mm -hmm. um, Leslie, you, I, and I think you've embodied it in this conversation today, um, but a comment that you've made in the past, which I think will resonate with our break liners, is it's perfectly natural to be both humble and bold. And this can be true in the course of a person's career. So, so even in your case, you started as, um, you started your career in McDonald's and at Macy's, and then you ended up building a business that, that um, was category defining. And, um, but it's also true as a set of mutually reinforcing personality traits. Um, and so what, can you share some experiences that you had that, that led you to that insight, that it was okay for these things to coexist? Yeah, I think, uh, well, number one, I think arrogance is super gross. And I learned the word, one of the first words I learned as a kid was the word cocky. I'm from Long Island, New York, 
and my dad would tell us about baseball players and he would point them out in the Mets. We'd see the Mets live. The cocky players were the ones who had the swagger about them and they'd always miss the ball. But the ones who you could tell were working hard, they were, they were just, you know, grateful <laughs> to be there. So I always, uh, I didn't want to be that cocky person that my dad said was a problem. So I think humility um, is completely separate from boldness and risk taking. I think it's, um, I, I always think about that fifth grader today who in 25 years is going to be your boss because uh, you're not better than anybody else and you're not more um, talented than anybody else. So I think that that, I think they're un, unrelated. I think you can be um, a risk taker with humility. So I, I think it, it just is part of uh, nature for me. When I was um, on the track team, it was better for me to be under play that I was going to, was really good than be the peacock. So I just, I just think that's a better way to run your life is that you're, um, you see, you see everyone on this a level playing field. That's mm -hmm. one of the things I'm, I'm digging about. I mean, if there's one thing to like about this horrible period that we're in as a, as a world in a global pandemic way is that we're all at home and we all have to figure out how to proceed and take, take on each day in the same exact situation. How are we gonna do that? I, I think that is so powerful. So many startups and large companies are thinking about what they're gonna do next. And the ones that are, have already adapted to the situation we're in and are already thinking about how they can help others in their businesses and, and in their careers going forward, they're ahead of it instead of worrying about how we're going to get out of this. They're already taking action. So it's like we're all, who's, who's going to make it are the ones that are already thinking about how they can help other people at the, at the end of this. So I, I, I look at the silver linings when it, when it comes to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Leslie, we have a question from Steve Schumacher. And he said, you mentioned creating buy-in with your employees and getting them invested in building a relationship with the customer. How did you cultivate this culture within Bare Minerals? And um, it reminds us a little bit about the anecdotes of asking employees to write to customers when they started with your company. Yeah, so, well, we would, the, so the customer letter thing was really important. So they were emails, but they were also real letters. And before meetings, uh, we would read a letter from a customer with the name, the date, the name, and what they said. So that would be before we would have a meeting. Then we'd have the letter wall that when we would have guests come into the company, they would see and be able to read hundreds of letters. And then when you joined, uh, you would get an address from our database and you would have to write a handwritten letter to on your first day to somebody who uh, was, was a customer, a long-standing customer. So it's uncomfortable to tell somebody when you're joining that you have to write and you have to tell them something personal about yourself. We know a lot about these people because we, we have, we know where they're shopping. We know what other things they're buying. We know a lot about them. Why don't you tell them something about you? It's only fair. So once you, uh, so people, when they join the company, they, they kind of knew this was going to be a little different experience. You can't, again, hide behind your computer. You've got to put yourself out there a little bit. And I think that that um, made them feel, even guys were in the makeup business, even men working in the company felt ownership. And they, they understood that when you're covering up rosacea on your skin and it makes a woman feel completely different. If they have acne and all of a sudden their skin's clearing up, the emotion behind that, because there's a letter that we're reading in a meeting, everyone can relate to that feeling of more confidence. Everyone, whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't matter what category you're in, bring them in to what these people are thinking and feeling, because it's a feeling business. But in my opinion, every business is a feeling business. If it's not, a, if you don't feel something, uh, what are you selling? What are you behind? So you, that's where, when we talked about emotions earlier, you have to bring, in my, you have to bring the emotion of why do people love your company so much? There was one customer, oh my gosh, her, 
we, we decided to go sell liquid foundation after all those years I'm on TV, TV telling people we're not going to do it. We can't do it. It's my name all on. We can't do it. But we had to do it because en too, enough people bought the, uh, the loose powder, but there we needed more customers, but we had to do it our way. So we decided to do liquid foundation. Well, got a letter from a woman who said, you know what? I'm having dinner. My husband, my husband, who doesn't wear makeup, by the way, thinks you're selling out, Leslie. He thinks that you said all along you weren't going to do this, and now you're doing it. Don't trust her, Luana. Don't trust this Leslie woman. She's out for the money. And of course, that broke my heart, but I knew something like that was going to happen. So I brought that letter, talked to her, called her. She told me more. She said, I told him, I trust Leslie. She's doing this for the right reasons. They're having an argument over dinner, by the way. I brought the letter to the team. And we listened to him and we talked to him and he helped us develop and craft our storytelling to the consumer. Because if he is that he was a skeptic, he didn't buy it. Well, if he didn't buy it and he's not even a user, think about people that do use the product. So we learned, we did our entire marketing campaign around what the periphery, the guy on the sidelines had to say to his wife. So in, we paid attention to every little detail. Who's saying what? It's not just your customers that have important things to say to you. It's the people who are related to your customers. So we brought them both in to the office and we had our company sit there asking them questions. What is it like to talk to your most loyal fan from Utah and the husband? So they were able to ask people who were joined, who were with the company for one year. She'd been wearing the product for 10 years. She was telling them, bring them in, fly them in, put them on Zoom, talk to them. It's just, we, there was never a, a place we didn't, you know, unpack or look, look under the rock. We, we just, we got all of our seedlings from different places. So boy, that guy, that husband, we call it the J effect. Well, I'm not with the company anymore, but that was what I call the J effect. Look outside where you think the answers are. And Oh, so cool. That was so cool. Um, so I have a related question. This is a second one from Haley Wilson, who informs me that she just bought your book. Aww, and she, um, this dovetails with what you were just talking about, sort of finding inspiration in unlikely places and in places where, frankly, lots of business people would be afraid to look. You know, there's a little bit of a human nature that that's going to be painful for me. So I'm going to shy away from whatever is over there. And Haley's asking, what is your go-to strategy for getting unstuck when you reach an impasse or you're not sure what to do next? And so- Oh my gosh, I love that question. Because you know, I never read beauty magazines. I didn't read fashion magazines. So where I just felt like that was incest or something. Like it was just to, to continue to read all the stuff year after year. And it was 30 years I was in the industry. It was just boring. Like I could never get my ideas from the industry. So I'm getting men's health, bodybuilding magazines. So when there were magazines, um, going to Broadway shows, sitting on a corner, watching people walk by, going to mountains and looking at um, trees. <laughs> I um, Talking to different people. I, I read a lot of books, but never about um, the industry that I was in. So it, it was it was never, I always, um, National Geographic, my whole life, nothing to do with the beauty industry, but I got more ideas from there than from Allure magazine. So I, that's, I just, I had to entertain myself um, and that's where I would relax the most. And the other thing in the book is um, I would write taglines for fun. I still do this. So, well, some people like crossword puzzles. Oh, by the way, I also, while I've been on quarantine, I've been making beanies with crochet. So I'm doing, I made 42 so far since we've been in quarantine. I just, as long as can I just show you literally 42 of these. So, um, Oh, so I write taglines for fun. So for me to relax, other than crocheting, is I will write a product name and I will write a tagline underneath it. So that's my uh, way of relaxing. And I get ideas from New the New Yorker magazine or from um, joke books. So it's just that it's, I play, I play games all the time. 
I don't know if that's helpful for you, but um, I, I, ha I have to stay inspired. I love keeping myself inspired. And it's been really interesting being at home in my house. Um, find, I have a book, bookshelves. You guys all have a million books you probably never even opened. So just like pull, pull out a book, open a book. I read the dictionary. I know that sounds like a strange thing to do, but there are words that I still don't know, like billions of them. There's a whole section in the book about words. So yeah, I, I uh, love it's getting inspired, finding new ways to do that. Um, Le Leslie, last question from us. Um, I'm watching, watching the time here. I want to be respectful of everyone's calendars. And you are um, one of the most successful business people in the world. And yet you, you show up and you lead with tremendous approachability. And I'm wondering how you cultivate that. How do you stay grounded? How do you stay connected with other people? Wow. How do I stay grounded? Um, I guess, you know, I, I've had my major stress moments in my life. I think I mentioned to you that I have a, like, I, I can be an anxious person and I could worry. So I think um, one, of the, one of the little tricks that I do to stay positive um, throughout my life is I had this bedside file I keep next to my bed of, of letters from people throughout my life that inspired me, that made me feel that I was on the right track. So if I was going to bed feeling negative, I always found that when once the sun set, something about nighttime would make me feel worse about myself. So... I just needed to always find ways to stay um, more positive. So those letters at night would be very helpful for me. And humor is a huge part of my life. And when I say that, I mean that I um, watch comedy specials, like stand-up comedy. I read funny books because the, actually the physical and the emotional benefits of laughing, I have to laugh every day, like really laugh. Um, it's not a joke. Oh, I didn't even mean that. It's, it's a, um, it's really a serious, it's a really serious thing for me that I know it's like, um, it pushes me over into positivity. So when I can find humor in something, I think I might, I can be a better me. And then I, and again, I just don't, I just feel like we're, we're all in this together. We just all want to do well in our lives. So I'm here for you. And I, I think you're here for each other. And we just need, we just are, it's our responsibility to help lift each other. So I think that's just my, I think that's my answer is that I try and stay light, um, appreciate what levity brings for me. And I just want to make a positive difference if I can. Leslie, such a pleasure to spend the last hour with you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our whole community and to Mrs. Lavin again for joining. Such a pleasure to have everyone. We love spending the time with all of you. Um, Thanks so much, everyone, for showing up today. I so appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Have a great night.